Listening in, uh, are they viewers? Like, yeah, viewers. I, I give them techni- the it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a paradox, but yeah, it's, call them viewers. <laughs> uh, Mo, what are we going to be talking about today? We are going over DC in live action, which is a very touchy subject <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Like, uh, you know when your parents tell you not to touch a hot stove? Uh, this is that, but the stove is also covered in lava. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're going to head, head first right into it. Um, so, like, just in general, I guess um, DC, we're both pretty big fans of it, I think it's safe to say. Um, but at the same time, I think we can both agree that while there's been some hits in uh, live action with DC... It's also struggled for like ever since its inception. Since uh, I, you could probably go back as far as if you want to say just on the big screen uh, with the original Superman cartoons, and then obviously the George Reeves TV series. And like, how do you feel like just to open this up with the history of uh, DC on TV and live action? Well, we know that TV was like the original, like it, it started on TV. Everything basically started on TV for, for superheroes at least. But if we go back, we can go way back to like the, the 40s Batman serials. That's what, I think that's what started it all, Batman and Superman at the time. And it's it's like a very long gap between that and like the and like the first actual like, uh, movie appearance, which was the 1960s Batman movie. So I think that's a good start-off point. Uh, the serials and the old, the old, for, like the the golden, the golden to silver age live action media. We can divide them into like the ages, sort of like similar to the comics. We have like the golden age of of live action, and then like the 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 silver age, a bit more crazy. Then we have the very dark age of the 90s. Uh, and then kind of like the Bronze Age of the 2000s. I think now we're in a very mixed age where it's like we have some things that really hit and some things that we just really, really miss the mark. And uh, historically... DC has had this problem of consistency. I think DC does great stuff, like absolutely fantastic stuff, but not all the time. And that's the problem. Uh, We have stuff that comes out and it's like maybe the best comic book movie or TV show ever made. But then you have some really bad stuff sprinkled in the middle. But then you have another really high point. It's just kind of a slippery slope of of bad. It, it's it's a very, it's it's a very uh, nerve wracking relationship with DC and live action, but one that you just stick with because damn it, you just love it. You just love it no matter what. <laughs> uh, I think you made such a good point, touch um, a good point, and kind of like the different ages and I guess audiences' reactions changing uh, because of how like mainstream superheroes are right now. Uh, which is a large part to the DC films, um, like animated series. Um, do you think that, especially compared to when it first started out with, like you say, the serials, that as the culture started taking comic books more seriously and uh, it becoming less of an outcast thing and more of a mainstream thing, do you think that's helped or hurt the movies? Because when you look at uh, Tim Burton or Nolan, when they were making their films, like even as early as Batman Begins, when that was in production, uh, Spider-Man and X-Men were still like recent phenomenon. Um, like, do you feel like as we've become more 
accustomed to trying to please fans, that's actually hurt the creativity. I think it's put a lot of pressure on them. Uh, because, yeah, as you mentioned, like the, the old, like when Superman came out in 1978, I don't think anybody was even expecting to see a Superman movie. Uh, and, and I think that there was a lot of doubt at the time. Like, how would they do it? And people just, it, it wasn't in demand at the time. Now superheroes are, are, they're the biggest thing in Hollywood right now. And it's just a constant competition of having to put out as much content as possible to, yeah, make the most money possible because at the end of the day, it's business. But at the same time, it's put, I think it, it puts pressure on both the studio and the studio puts pressure on the actual like creative teams because they have to reach a certain expectation because back then there, there were no expectations. You could get away with anything like Superman quest for peace. Come on. Like, <laughs> you could <laughs> never get away with stuff like that now, but, but at the fair, time people, people didn't really care. Got away with it because it did kind of cancel the entire franchise for a little bit. Yeah, but then you have, then you get stuff like Batman and Robin, and you think, well, they, they, just, they just didn't learn their lesson. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it's, it, it, it I, I think it, it was more uh, stress free back then to make something, but at the same time, it wasn't, because it wasn't so mainstream, it might have been a bit more difficult. Because now, if we look at the current state of, of superhero movies, we have genuinely good movies, like movies that could stand on their own, movies that are now being nominated for Oscars. But at the time, uh, there wasn't that much competition, even, even if it's just DC. Like DC now, like they release Aquaman, right? And Aquaman does really good. And and people enough people like it enough maybe to uh, people like it like that's enough I guess, but now it's like well how do we top Aquaman, not just competing with like other studios or other properties, just trying to top themselves is now just it's it's a difficult job, but back then I think it was it was a little more laid back, uh, like Tim Bur like Batman Returns man. Like you could never give a director that much freedom with the Batman uh, characters now. Like I don't think if Matt Reeves went into Warner Brothers right now and told them, "I'm gonna have Batman set people on fire, blow them up, strap bombs to their stomachs, and 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 Catwoman and Penguin is just completely, it's just absolutely insane, and penguins eating off people's noses," they would be yeah. like, "No." Why? Danny DeVito but to back then, someone's <laughs> no, think about that as well, because that's not just like a on the day moment. Yeah, it had to be in the script. They had to get a prosthetic for that. They had to film. They had to shoot that scene probably multiple times because God knows if the effects and blood work work properly. <laughs> <And> they, <laughs> like Danny DeVito had to eat that guy's nose like five different times probably. <laughs> yeah, I think was a different right. time. I think you're right. I think there's just like a complete disconnect between, uh, because these are so, a lot of these are kind of carrying, like Sony is being carried basically by like Spider-Man at the moment. Like having Mar Marvel, oh. like having, they've always kind of been carried by Spider-Man, honestly, uh, just in terms of their profits or movies. That's, that's one of the only big franchises they have. Uh, Warner Brothers and even Marvel Studios just as itself is just, a lot of these big companies are so guaranteed that, oh, a superhero movie will be a big success. And in a way, they're kind of flooded the market. Like, I love superheroes and I'll watch all of these, but I know some people who don't, and they're getting kind of sick of it, and it's kind of making them, um, for the films that they normally would enjoy, but because they've seen so many that same year, it lessens that experience for them. And DC, I feel like, because we're kind of honing on DC specifically, DC, I feel like, specifically has the complete asinine, like, I I'm sure everyone listening to this, like, knows, what in the hell are they announcing at these board meetings? Like, there's going to be a <laughs> trench meeting? Like, like there's going to be, like, 
50 new films of, and none of them will be Nightwing or Superman, like, I know, like, all of them will have, like, spin-ups and sequels and alternative universe takes, it's like, remember the Joss Whedon Batgirl movie? <laughs> that went! <laughs> like, <laughs> they seem to just be announcing things willy-nilly, like you say, um, when they, to get content out. I feel that's the problem DC is, has, is they're kind of throwing everything at the wall, including their TV shows, because we kind of talk about movies, it's just like, do you feel like with all the superhero movie, uh, the new DC streaming service, the shows they've got on CW, the movies they're trying to pump out, do you think DC's doing too much? Do you think there's too many creative visions happening all at the same time? Whereas in uh, the olden days, we kind of have, you get the Superman movies for a couple of years, and then you get the Batman movies for a couple of years, and there'd be nothing around it, so people could just focus on those. Yeah, I think they're definitely biting off more than they could chew with both the movies and the TV shows, because, like, yeah, they, they announce a million movies, like, every other month. I think they have, like, like 13 movies right now that should be in development, and we're not going to see any of them. I think it, would, it will take a long time. Like, like the, the, the Lobo, there's been a Lobo movie in production since, like, 2010. We're never seeing that Lobo movie. Never. Uh, but they keep announcing it. Like, Plastic Man, that came out for, like, a hot second and then completely disappeared. But, this, but the thing is, they, they throw so much stuff at the wall with the movies but they end up making like very little of them. Like uh, how many movies have they announced since then? And now like the only movies that are actual in production are like Birds of Prey, Joker, uh, Wonder Woman 84, and like the Batman, that's it. Where there's no Flash movie in production. There's no like a million other, there's no Nightwing, no Deathstroke, none of that. But with the shows, they're actually putting them out there. Uh, I think I, I was I was calculating it. I don't think like all of 2019, we won't have like two or three weeks without an episode of a DC show. That's insane to me. Yeah, absolutely. We have like 13 shows this year alone. And well, I I like I'll watch all of them. I don't care. I I will watch anything that DC puts out, even if I don't like it. I'll still watch it because again, it's a very very complicated relationship uh but at the same time it's like sometimes it, it becomes too much it becomes too much even for them like now they have like five shows on the cw and by october they'll have like six with batwoman and they're already not able to keep that schedule on they keep taking breaks and they keep doing like rotating schedules like legends has been on break for like two months and it will be on break till april like if if you can't handle that many shows at once, then don't do that many shows at once. Uh, it's not about quantity. Uh, it's really just about the quality and, again, consistency. Because if even if we look at the TV shows, they do have a consistent, consistency problems ever since Smallville. Like Smallville would have some really good seasons and then some really bad seasons. Yeah. And then good seasons again, and that carried over into like the CW shows. And then uh, Titans, I guess, like it has like its episodes, like it has really high points and has really low points. So again, if if you're not gonna focus on on making each individual thing special, then just don't bother trying to put out as much content as possible, because fans. Well, I don't think fans can even keep up with that many TV shows at once because they don't like I don't think anybody just watches like one thing like I'll just watch the DC shows and completely ignore them. like you'd have to be crazy if you're just watching like every single DC show and be like oh no I'm never watching Daredevil. No that, you, you that's insane. <laughs> but at the same time they can't like I'm I'm I try to keep up with all of them. I'm like three episodes behind on Black Lightning. I can't I can't physically watch all of them and keep up with all of them. And you're trying. And and like if God help people who <laughs> like who don't have your willpower to do this. Like <laughs> and even you can't do that. So I think you you really like kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's just like who do they expect to be watching all of these things? Exactly, and the streaming service stuff 
Is it enough? Was Titans enough to sell the streaming service? I don't think so. Uh, I I like their ideas. I mean, the star that Star Girl show. I I would I would give my my kidney to have that right now, because it's it's everything that I've ever wanted. It's like it's combining the Jeff Johns Star Girl with the, the Jeff Johns JSA run, which is just which is holy to me. But at the same time. I'm worried, like, you have so much stuff, will it just get crammed in the middle or will it actually have time to, to properly grow and prosper into a, a quality show? And that's the same thing with the movies. They're trying to rush out so many things at once that a lot of it just kind of gets lost in the middle. Uh, I'll ask you this then to kind of close up. Um, if you were ta transported through some crazy means or another in the cosmic hierarchy, like Dr. Manhattan decides that you are the key to everything, and he places you in the DC boardroom, and you've got Jeff Johns, you've got Jim Lee, you've got Dan DiDio, you've got all the big wigs, like even the nameless, faceless ones, who are in charge of all of us, and you have complete, total power. Uh... What what would be your pitch? What would be your plan? Where where do you go from here? Uh, I think I try to do something different because I think I've mentioned this before. I don't want DC to do what Marvel's doing. They should have their own thing because I don't want to see an MCU with just DC characters. Like I'm like that line is is very transparent to me that it's just if you replace Iron Man and Captain America with Batman and Superman, it's just it won't be special. What I would do is these characters are so iconic at this point that you don't need introductions. I would I would give anything to stop making origin movies. I'm so tired of origin stories, especially for, for the big ones like Batman and Superman. I would do a thing where it's just like an established DC universe, like the comics, and just keep doing whatever I want. I, if I want to make a, a 60s set Superman movie, I'll just do it. If you want to make a, a Judas contract in the 80s, do it. If you want to make – it doesn't have to be like a set timeline because – at this point, I think that fans don't care. Like, I think a very good example of that was Krypton and Titans. Uh, on Krypton, they just Adam Strange just mentions that there's a Justice League and there's a Superman, and they send him on this mission. They didn't bother setting all that up. It's just okay, they're there. On Titans, it was just uh, Donna Troy and, and Dick Grayson talking about the Joker, talking about Wonder Woman, talking about Justice League, and and fans just. I don't think people minded that. I think if you do that without having to introduce everything and having to keep a set timeline with everything interconnected, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, if you want to make just a random Green Arrow movie set, because DC has like, they've been around since the 30s. And we have a thing where everything has to be set in modern day. And I don't know why, because yeah, I agree. if you... You can just go back and read a comic from from the seventies, and that's incredible. You can go back and read Green Arrow, Green Lantern, like that an incredible uh, uh, comic series from the seventies, uh, Hard Traveling Heroes, and and you want to adapt it, I guess, for modern day. Why why would you do it for modern day? Just do it in the seventies, uh, because DC has been has such a rich history. You don't have to to alter that history and reshape it into a realistic interpretation where that started in a single year and it's going so-and-so uh, and these actors are aging. Like I have a problem with in Shazam, right? You have Billy Batson, who's 15. The actor, by the time he finishes filming the movie, he's like 17. In two years, when Billy Batson maybe returns again, he'll be like 19. And then he just keep getting older. But in the comics, Billy Batson never ages. So that's that's a problem. Do you keep Billy young and just completely let go of that realistic aspect? Or do you go outside of the comics and have Billy like actually age through every movie, eventually getting into his 20s 
which would be a bit odd, I guess, for for fans of the character because they're always used to be Billy being the kid and Shazam being the adult. So you don't need just every single thing articulated and 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 counted for in a single interconnected universe. Just do whatever, do whatever you want, and just don't care because fans won't care. Uh, so basically, our advice to these people who get paid millions and millions of dollars. Stop trying so hard. It's pretty easy. We're too focused <laughs> on the internet, and we kind of figured this out in like a non-scripted twenty-minute video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at the same time, comic writers have figured this out like decades ago. Yeah. Because not every writer cares about what what's going on at the moment. Uh, like someone like Brian Michael Bendis comes to mind, who's doing like the Incredible Young Justice new series now. Uh, does it really make sense fitting into the current universe? No. Do I care? No. I'm enjoying it, and it's fine. So as long as they keep putting out quality, the continuity and interconnectedness really doesn't matter. Uh, I think that's a good point to end on. Uh, Mo, I really enjoyed having you on for this, and I hope we continue to do more and more in the future. I really enjoyed being here. <laughs> I, I think I... Like go on and just babble on too much. <laughs> it's a problem, but I really enjoy being on the show and talking to you. No worries, man. We love it. Uh, where, if people, again, I already kind of shouted you out at the beginning for people who know you already. But if people don't know you already and now have been effectively seduced by hearing you interrupted talk, <laughs> where can they find you? They can find me on Talking the JSA on Twitter where I obsess over a bunch of old men wearing tights every day. Excellent. And we have pictures of them exclusively drawn by many, many <laughs> in tight clothing. Uh, so yes, we have been your Geeks for Fun this today, and we'll wish you a good day, a good night, a good whatever. Take it easy. Good night, everyone.